Welcome to Woodbury Writes Podcast. I'm Sandy Carlson, your host, and I'm here today with Bruce Coffin of Hamden, Connecticut and Woodstock, Vermont. Bruce is a former school teacher at independent schools in England and the United States, including Westover in nearby Middlebury. And he is the author of two memoirs, one, The Long Light of Those Days, and the other, Among Familiar Shadows. Welcome, Bruce. Good to be here. It's exciting to talk to you about your beautiful memoirs and and your writing experience. Would you uh, just introduce yourself to us as a writer? Yes, well, I didn't write either one of these books as books. They ended up just being collections of pieces that I'd written at, at odd times, especially the second one, Among Familiar Shadows. The first one came about after I had written two separate essays on the, my hometown, the Woodstock, Vermont, that I, I grew up in in the, in the 40s and 50s. I showed them to my brother, the, the, first, the first two essays here, who himself was a, a journalist and then became a, a sort of prominent Civil War historian and person very important in the saving of Civil War battlefields in Pennsylvania and Virginia. So he was the accomplished writer in the, the family, and he read what I had written about our growing up, and he said, hey, maybe we should maybe we should do a book together about this. And I didn't say anything because I thought to myself, I don't think that would work <laughs> for various reasons. And so I just, we dropped it. But the idea of a book was interesting, so I just wrote a chapter every summer when I was when I was off from teaching. At the end, I thought I was done, and then I had one more chapter that came to me. And then I sent them off to a former student of mine from Westover who had become an editor at Modern Library. And she read them, and she said, oh, I think let's put them together in this way. And she assembled the chapters in, in a way that I found that I couldn't quarrel with at all. So then I wrote an introductory chapter, and we passed it on to Elm Tree Press in Woodstock, and they decided to publish it that way. And then this, the second one was just an assemblage of, that is, among familiar shadows, was an assemblage of essays that I passed on to a, publish, a publisher friend of mine, and he suggested that we take only the ones uh, dealing specifically with Vermont, because that would make it in, easier for reviewers. So I, I, in reading Among Familiar Shadows, I have to say that uh, although they are clearly and vividly set in Vermont, so much of the New England character I could identify with with my own family. And I think while it's really rooted in Vermont, it's so so true, I think, of a, a time in our our history and the way people behaved, and it's so, so beautifully done. I feel like I'm in Vermont, and I also feel quite at home. Oh, good. Can you tell us who, who inspires you as an author? Who are your, your favorite authors out there? Well, first of all, I would say what what inspires me, I mean, to write in the, in the, in, in the first place, because I don't, I'm not a very disciplined writer. I wish I was. I wish I could follow the advice that I used to give my students, and that is if they're going to be a writer, they should sit down and write something every day, even if they don't have anything to say. They should just start writing and, and see what happens. I tend not to do that. I wait until there's a terrific pressure. I feel a terrific pressure to give some shape to feelings and vague ideas, you know, some necessity to force them into some kind of clarity or consciousness. And, and, uh, and this is true, I mean, whether I'm writing memoirs, whether these are experiences in my own life that are, that are making me feel as though they need ordering, or, or whether I'm, uh, this is coming from my experience as a reader. So I, I write memoir, I guess you'd say I write memoir and I, li I write some form of literary criticism. Those are the, the, the only two, two uh, sorts of, of essays that I've written. And it's true with your experience with literature, too, I find, and that is, um, at the moment, or for, for quite some time, there are two chapters from book two of Tolstoy's War and Peace that don't seem to leave me alone. 
I suppose eventually I'm going to have to try to say something about those. And it's also true of a of a character in, in uh, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment who has been haunting me now for at least 15 or 20 years. And my son is insistent that I try and write something about. So, but you say writers that have inspired? Yeah, um, sounds like Russian literature has its influence on you. Are those your your favorite authors, or we, I taught a lot of Russian literature and translation at at at, uh, at Westover, and and rather than than teach a, a a great many books, it was nineteenth century Russian literature for the most part, and rather than teach a great many different books by different writers. Uh, we, my colleague Tom Hungerford and I, focused on you know the great classics. So, so we worked on on Tolstoy and, and Dostoevsky primarily. But favorite authors, there's so many, starting with Chaucer and, and Shakespeare and and running through Thomas Hardy, who was the writer that first got me interested in in literature when I was in high school, doing nothing but being a sort of menace and upsetting my teachers and getting a bad disciplinary record. <laughs> Along comes one great teacher in my senior year, and he assigned The Return of the Native by Thomas Hardy, and I never looked back. Why did, that, why did that text resonate with you? Landscape. Landscape? Yeah, it was Landscape that did it for me, you know, uh, but but that that book rescued me, and that great, that great teacher. And Conrad, I'm just spellbound by by Conrad and E.M. Forster has been a, uh, a formative writer and then through the mother a lot of modern writers I mean right up through Jane Gardam the contemporary English novelist although she's pretty old now and a number of contemporary British and and, uh, and American writers have been important when I started writing the two writers that meant most to me were the American novelist and short story writer William Maxwell, who for years was the fiction editor at the New Yorker, and the lesser known, although Maxwell's a pretty well kept secret, there are a lot of people who still don't know William Maxwell or his work, and a better kept secret even that, J.L. Carr, the English novelist, who's best known for his best work which is a little, you'd have to almost call it a novella. It's 111 pages in, in the American edition called A Month in the Country. And it's best known as a movie, movie they made out of it during Carr's lifetime. He's dead now, but uh, starring Kenneth Branagh and Colin Firth. And it was those, those books that seemed to influence everything I was doing in writing about earlier times and in my life and in uh, my two books. And I suppose it was the elegiac tone of those books that kept me focused. And with Maxwell, it was the great concreteness of his narrative that just gave me a purchase on the events of my own, my own past. Would you uh, share a line from, from their works with us so we can kind yeah. of put their voice in the conversation? Yeah. The novel, They Came Like Swallows, Maxwell thought the sequel to, to this book, the sequel is called So Long, See You Tomorrow. And it won, I think, a National Book Award or something. And Maxwell thinks of that book as his, as his greatest. I beg to differ. They Came Like Swallows is, is one of the great American novels. Um, and I taught it for years at Westover. And I recom I've recommended, to, recommended it to a number of people. And on the basis of my own experience as a teacher and watching what it does to my students and what it does to, what it has done to the people who've read it, I will tell you that it will knock you over. It's, it's, it's perhaps the most moving novel I've ever read without being in the least sentimental and it is a beautiful, beautiful book. 227 pages, it's not a big book. The novel's based on 
Maxwell's loss of his mother in the 1918 Spanish influenza epidemic. When Maxwell was only a child, I think he was 11, 10 or 11, something like that. And the short passage I'll read is from part two of the book. Uh, part one is the focus is on Bunny, who's the fictional name for, for William Maxwell. Part two is on Robert, Bunny's brother, who's slightly older. And part three is focuses on their father. Those three parts make up the novel. And this is from part two. This is his brother Robert's recollection of their mother from a family outing they all went on. And I quote, And Robert went up the creek and over a bridge where he could cast without getting his line caught in the overhanging branches. His mother smiled at him from the opposite bank, and it seemed to him that she was smiling at the sky also, and at the creek, and at the yellow leaves which came down, sometimes by the dozen, and sailed in under the bank and out again. End quote. And what you have here, I think, is her, his mother's, approval of him and of his ways, which are his and his alone, and of all that he has it in himself to do, and also her approval of the world in which he'll carry out his purposes. This recollection is part of what will sustain him when she is gone, which she will be by the time he wakes up in the morning after this recollection. Wow. Yeah, you have to read this book. It's one of the great classics. Would you just share in the podcast what, what is your students' response to that? That like how do how do the how do the young women at Westover, how do they respond? I always warn them in, in advance they're going to be knocked over by this book. I mean, it, it's a test for readers. If you're a good reader, if you're a good reader, this is really, this is really going to have some effect on you. And years afterwards, years afterwards, I was out at Dominic and Pia's a little pizza place in Waterbury for lunch with a former student of mine. And she said, as we were eating pizza, she said, among the things I learned from you, two seem to stand out with me. I said, oh, really? <laughs> and she said, what? She said, well, first of all, you taught me that if you eat pizza fast enough, you won't realize how full you are. <laughs> I said, and that's what we're doing right now. She said, I think we are. And I said, what's the second one? She said, that it's quite all right to weep, even in class when you're reading William Maxwell. Oh, that's a powerful, yeah. powerful thing to share. And Bianca Sederna, um, Matt Wood's, stepdaughter. I don't mm -hmm. know the painter, but Matt was. Right. Bianca Sederna was one of my great Maxwell students, and she was a terrifically sensitive reader and a wonderful English student, and she had more to say. I mean, there, she taught me things about the book because she got so deeply into it. But there were moments in class when she was sobbing out insights. That is the power of I didn't literature. stop her, wow. and nobody wow. stopped her. She had her handkerchief there, and she was doing the best she could. And boy, we were writing down what she was saying because she was onto it. It's a it's a tremendous book. It's hard to see how he does it because because there's nothing sentimental at all in that book. There's not an ounce of sentiment. There's no self indulgence whatsoever. He does it all by as I used to tell my students, and you're going to hear it in writing workshops over and over and over again. Show, don't tell. Maxwell's a genius at it. Yeah, yeah you, know, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of, among familiar shadows, this, the section called Patrimony, and the description that you have of, of the discovery of the portrait in the bedroom that seems so far away from the Thanksgiving Day celebration. Yeah. Had that effect on me as a reader. I was absolutely floored. You know, when we we get there, you get the sense that something's coming, but what that is exactly and how that opens up those other characters and the evidence of that we can accumulate in the reading of your work to derive some kind of insight into what might be going on with, with the uncles. 
yeah. is really, really, really powerful. So I think the the combination of the concrete and the elegiac come through in oh, your, yeah. your writing as, oh, as well. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. You just It just doesn't work very well to talk about feeling. Um, whatever feelings you're trying to convey, well, it's... it's it's T.S. Eliot's subjective correlative. You, mm -hmm. know, you, you find the right details, you find the right concrete images, and you can make it work. But that's how the private becomes public domain. Because after all, our subjective lives are hidden and internal and entirely ours. If we can hook them up somehow or other to recognizable things and details from the, from the public world, then they become everybody. With, with that in mind, could we could we talk about the role of, of place in in your writing? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the long light of those days is an elegy for a place. I mean, it has all to, together, and that's what I was trying to do was to recover and bring back a place that had pretty much, except in name, ceased to exist. Woodstock, Vermont, now is it's a tourist mecca, intent on making money by selling itself in some sort of quaint New England village. And I wanted to put it back just as it was in the 40s and, and 50s before it became a tourist trap. When it was a real village, you know, and it served the needs of real people back then instead of just uh, consumer demands of visitors and transients. There are so many greedy real estate investors that seem to be pretty much in control of it that it's real. The, the, the buildings that used to be homes and, and uh, properties that belong to families are now simply real estate investments. And it's not a particularly great place to be as it, as, it, as it once was. And it made me think, you know, I've been thinking a lot about place as I, as I said before, um, that you could even say maybe, it, it, in one sense, it's not even a place anymore. It's a location. And by that, I mean, somehow, right, you can be in it, but you can't any longer be of it. And by place there, I guess I mean some sort of gathering or a synthesis of space and self and time. And that would serve, I suppose, as um, a description of those places in your life that you're most familiar with. They're not just localizations in space. There's something much, much more ingredient there. The saying now that goes up there anyway is that one of the best things about Woodstock is its proximity to Vermont. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Oh, wow. Real estate people don't like yeah. to hear that, wow. but I think whoever coined that one is, is really uh, has, has really said it. But the, the, this whole subject of place, I, it, it hits me because I've been giving it a great deal of thought, and it's the concern of the two essays I'm try, I'm struggling to finish. And my second book, Among Familiar Shadows, recalls family members and old friends largely by situating them in such a way as to bring them back to life. As though somehow or other the place comes first, and then if you get that, then the people are going to make their, their appearance. At least that's the way it, it works with me. Especially in the long chapter called Patrimony, which is on my father's family. And this placing them, this situating means placing them among the details and concrete images of the world as it was in, in their time. You know, and, and if you ask somebody, I was thinking about this the other day. If you ask somebody, for instance, oh, do you remember Charlie Thompson? Or do you remember Anna Bythro? Or whoever it might be. And in the process of trying to recall this person that you've just been asking your friend about, if he doesn't have too much success in doing so, he may say, no, I can't seem to place him. And that way of manner of speaking, you know, interests me. You know, the rule for writing, as we've said, is show, don't tell. So that it helps me, I know, that if I show the place and I assemble its details, rather than simply in telling about it, then its people are going to suddenly come back to life. And, you know, I think, I think um, you know, in the age of the sort of the corporate 
gypsy and people just going where the work is. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. this place really gets under undersold, That's you right. know? That's and right. I think in New England towns, there's always been that tension between the people who know the place, know yeah. the neighbors, know the quirks, yeah. and the people blowing through, you know? There was a woman, actually, she was the secretary of St. John's in Waterbury, once remarked that, and this may be true of New England, but she said, people in Connecticut give directions by what used to be there. Where that thing used to be, where the tree used to grow, and that is yeah. how we, we remember. And it's uh, somehow honoring the commitment to the relationship with the people around you and the ground under your feet. They they are f all formative. That we experience these seasons and and yeah. the length of these days makes a difference. Yeah. You know, and uh, honoring that is a real revelation. Yeah. And and you, you do it so well in the in, and well, we still right. orient ourselves. I mean, my, my my oldest friends up there, the ones I grew up with, we still orient ourselves by the names of the of, that used to be on the buildings downtown because we haven't been able to keep track of all the places that have succeeded them. And so the uh, we still go by the names or houses. We don't know the, the 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 particular number on the address, so we just name the people who lived there when we were there, and we know exactly what. And of course, anybody else was, who'd be listening to us would say. <laughs> no such business down in downtown. There was, there was, and that's what counts. One of the one of the really best people to read on this on place is Wendell Berry. Wendell Berry. Yeah, because he's been in the same place for so long, and he's eloquent on what it means, on what deep familiarity means when the date of what would have been my father's hundredth birthday came. Round. I wanted to be in Woodstock on August 7th, on August 1st, 2007, because he was born August 1st, 1907. But I couldn't be. I was in, I had to be in Connecticut. So I decided to spend the entire day taking an imaginary walk around the village where he spent his entire life, except for one year when he was in Boston at Wentworth, the year after he graduated from high school. And then I, so I started thinking about what it would have been like to have been in one place all of one's life. And the layers and layers and layers of association with almost any particular location in that, in that town. A doorway, a fence post, a parking meter, a tree. I suppose it's, it's, the choice you make in your life between climbing a thousand mountains and climbing one mountain a thousand times. Right. There's a kind of knowledge there in the one mountain that's pretty hard to describe to anybody who's an adventurer. And Barry is the great eloquent voice for the man who's climbed the one mountain a thousand times. And it's, it's his essays, I think. I don't value his poetry or his fiction as much as his essays. He's a great essayist. Yeah. Sounds sounds like a, a great a great resource. Like, like you, I, I share a fascination with with place and, and history and my own family is sort of deeply rooted in this part of Connecticut and I have an uncle in Roxbury who gives directions according to where the trees and the rocks are. Yep. And yep. and the geographical features. Yep. And they happen to have road names but it's of no consequence. And there's an intimacy there, an intimacy yes. and an acceptance that yeah. is very, very gratifying. Yes. You know, because you don't have to be on, you're just home. That's right. You know, and it's 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 very, very powerful. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So back, back to your your work, though, Bruce. Uh, would you share us, with us what you feel is the, the best line you ever wrote? I've got a couple. One from one book and and one from another. It's difficult to do because to take sentences out of context, but here are two sentences. I'm going to cheat. In both cases, I'm going to give two. The first one comes from a chapter called Pember Inn in, from the long light of those days, which was one of the first chapters that I wrote. It's a piece that celebrates a, a great friend of mine named George Pearsons, who I met when I was six years old, the first day of school, and who died at age 20 in an automobile accident uh, when we were in college. So here, here are two sentences. 
and they have to do with a moment in the last full day I ever spent with him, which was about probably two or three months before his uh, before his untimely death. We'd gone up to Montreal and tried to uh, locate tramp steamers that would give us ch a cheap crossing to Europe, where we were going to bum around and try to find work. We were going to we dropped out of college for a year to do this. It didn't work. Of course, but, <laughs> but anyway. And coming back, we were driving down Route 7 in, in uh, Vermont. We pulled over because we were sleepy, and we just stopped beside the road and got out for some fresh air. And here are the two passages. I picture us standing outside George's Plymouth in the cold, late autumn twilight air, looking out across a flat, rocky pasture at a darkening bank of clouds piling up in the western sky. George was talking about Moby Dick and pondering the biblical significance of the moment when the Pequod meets the whaling ship Rachel, which has been rammed by the great white whale and is wandering in search of her lost children of the sea. End quote. So many of the specific details here in hindsight seem metaphorical in a way that they weren't at all intended to be when I was writing. And though we didn't know it here, the darkness that's described here, of course, is uh, physical darkness, is, a, is another kind of darkness coming on in our lives. And, but it's the second sentence that knocks me over. And if any, anybody in, in, in either of those books, if anybody said, you know what? Show me what you think is a good sentence. It would be this, the second one of his talking about Moby Dick. And I looked at it when I was putting this, when I was thinking about this, and I thought, well, like most effective descriptive sentences, it's a loose sentence instead of a periodic mm -hmm. sentence. It doesn't put its modifiers first and emphat emphatically with the subject. It goes the other way around. It states its subject and, and lets the sentence trail off, in this case with a series of verbal phrases, I mean verb phrases, and subordinate clause. Um, most descriptive, great descriptive sentences are, are loose sentences rather than periodic sentences. I love the sound of it. I'm going to read it once more. George was talking about Moby Dick and pondering the biblical significance of the moment when the Pequod meets the whaling ship Rachel, which has been rammed by the great whale and is wandering in search of her lost children of the sea. And something else, though, I've never tried to pinpoint it before, and that is so many of us who knew him would for a very long time feel like lost children of the sea after his death and see somehow here making the loss immeasurable. The, the meanings kind of keep opening up in yes, the, the do. language. They do. Yeah. Yeah. And and of course since the book was written after a long time after his death, all of that was affecting my choice of words and whatnot, but not in any conscious not in any conscious way. And I'll read one more. The the the, the other sentences from the second book. Here's the, the two sentences from among familiar shadows, describing the experience of blackberry picking by myself up in the hills of South Pomfret, Vermont, which I used to do obsessively in the 1980s. While I was thus attached to the earth and riveted to blackberries, and my hands were busy picking, my inner wanderings would carry me out and away until time out of mind, I'd be lost in a way possible only in places as long and deeply familiar as the Pomfret Hills. It would take the buzzing of a honeybee on a nearby wild rose bush, or the late summer dirge of the crickets, or the cawing of a crow passing over on his way to distant places to bring me back, and I'd look up, disoriented, at the world before me, the sun having traveled west, the old hills there under a different slant of light, the wind moving a slowly passing high white cloud and riffling the top leaves of a nearby poplar, all of it 
transfigured, and strangely attentive. And these two sentences, I, I suppose, because they're the build-up to a sort of mystical moment I experienced more than once uh, when I was in my solitary berry-picking adventures there. And uh, something like the natural revelation that the New England transcendentalists were always writing about, Thoreau and, and Emerson. And because the experience here is being rendered once again by reference to place and the experience itself is is being shown rather than talked about so once again it's the the attempt at least whether it's successful or not at conveying deep feeling by description i was just going to say that those specific concrete details that make it so vivid and, and the, the imagery is so so rich yeah. that it, it just resonates emotionally through its concreteness. It's yeah, it ought to convey some sense of wonder that would overtake me every time I mm. got caught in that way. I'd be lost in a way possible only in places as long and deeply familiar as the Pomfret Hills. I mean, there's a paradox in being lost in what is familiar. Exactly, yeah. But that's that that sense that you you said intimacy, I said familiarity. That's what Wendell Berry is talking about, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And you, you know, you talked about lyric poets presenting language in a way that stays with you. And I think that lyricism in that passage too, Bruce, that is just very compelling. Oh, good. And what are your thoughts about the relationship between the, the reader and the writer? Well, you know, when I first started uh, writing, I would I showed things to my brother, and he was a great help. Two of the pieces that he helped me with, I still haven't, uh, came out in magazines, but they've never been they've never been put into a book. He could edit, and he'd read something and just immediately start hacking <laughs> arrows and stuff. And uh, and one of the things that that I didn't know what to do with right from the beginning was he would say from time to time, "Remember your readers." That is. Who are you writing this for? Mm -hmm. And I've never had any way of answering that question. I, I, it's nothing that ever occurs to me. And it would seem obstructive for me to start thinking of that in the writing process. I think it would deter me from writing. If, if that was the thing I had to be mindful of when I sat down to, to start. So, and I've never known any serious writers, except journalists, who were much concerned about that. And for me, and I find this intriguing, this is why I was thinking about this. The reader, for me, first appears and becomes a kind of unconscious, shadowy presence when I'm revising and revising yet again what I've written. But the only way I know I've got it right, okay, and I don't have to work on this passage, anymore, I think, is when suddenly I am the reader. And I say, wow, who wrote that? And I know I've done it. And boy, Stephen Dobbins, who's a cantankerous poet who's made a lot of enemies, has written a book on, on writing poetry. And he says what keeps him revising through a number of drafts is, quote, the attempt to free the work from myself, its author, and to deliver it to the reader, end quote. He goes on to say, quote, it is the perfection of structure that allows the work to transcend its author, allows the work to be complete in itself. If the structure is imperfect, then the work remains tied to the writer. But the work belongs to the reader. It must be moved from the quirky specificity of the writer's life to the greater universality of the reader's life. End quote. And that almost, that says almost exactly what my experience has been of that moment when you suddenly think, ooh, who wrote that? See, then you're the reader. And who did write it? Did you write it? Well, 
you and inspiration. I'm still believing in inspiration. Something's coming from somewhere. That's right. Those muses are busy. Uh, the muse. <laughs> you and the muse, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, you, you, you see many books that, that haven't been edited properly, particularly, I think, in memoir. And the thing that bothers you is that the writer keeps getting in her own way. Get yourself out of it. Remove yourself. You need another draft or two of this, and it'll be ours, maybe. There's a there's an awful lot of self-absorption there can be in, in in any kind of subjective writing. I mean, memoir. Give it to the material. I think I think that speaks to the importance of a, a trusted reader, somebody who will honor the work as as being valuable in and of itself, outside of our heads. You yeah. know, and it's yeah. it's why art is not catharsis. You know, that very personal experience, that first draft experience is all yours, like you said. It's it's the reader creeping in as you're as you're thinking, who how does this sound? How does this how, what is this experience I've put on the page? And it speaks volumes and it takes me back to the beginning when I said even though your 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 books are rooted in Vermont I could feel those words on the page, and they resonated with me in, in many different ways about human experience, growing up surrounded by elders from another generation, another set of influences and experiences, world events that mm -hmm. I didn't have the capacity as a yeah. child to know happened yeah. that shaped them, uh, and, and to piece it together over time to bring it out of those familiar shadows is, is what you've accomplished in, this, um, in your work. Well, I've tried to. I, I you know, it's, it, it's still all those. And I, 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 I tell my students, if you're ever going to be a writer, you have to read and read and read and read and become uh, just knocked out by some of the stuff that you, you read. You have to be taken over by some of that stuff you read because you've got to get you've got to get the syntax and you've got to get all kinds of, of the, the elements of a writer, the overtones, the moods, everything. You, they have to become internalized. Um, and that's where your voice is going to come from. Mm -hmm. It sounds paradoxical because whose voice? Yours. You know, all these great writers became great writers because of all they read. You know, their own voice emerges from all the voices they internalize. So how are you going to know when your own work is satisfactory as a reader? when it sounds like all the great stuff you've read, I guess. And maybe that is the, the writer's place as you defined it, a, um, the confluence of space and self and time, yeah. you know? Super. Well, Bruce, thank you so much for this engaging conversation. I feel like I've, uh, I've learned so much about you and your books and just literature in general. So well, thank, thank you. you. I, I've enjoyed it.